Good morning. Happy Sabbath, New World Church. It is so good to see you. I know the weather became much warmer, and it's like summer. So greetings to all of you and also those who are watching us online. Just a couple of announcements, starting with an Adra appeal. Nick? Thank you. Do we have the brief video? Any chance? My office overlooks a beautiful park full of vibrant colors. Having a passion for the environment, I enjoy and indulge in the blessings and benefits of the natural world. Being able to enjoy God's creation truly is a privilege. But I am saddened that humanity, God's greatest creation, is suffering in so many parts of the world. The current cholera outbreak in Zambia, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, the war in Gaza. These are just a few of the crises that affect our world. At Adra UK, our mission is to serve humanity so that all may live as God intended. Give now. We can't do it without you. Your support makes our work possible. Your generous gift now will have a direct and life-saving impact worldwide. So to donate, click on the link in the bio, scan the QR code, or visit adra.org.uk backslash donate. So, uh... Happy Sabbath, everyone. Just a reminder, the ADRA appeal, the annual ADRA appeal, the first one they've been able to hold in five years, continues uh, throughout the month of April. And we're collecting funds in various different ways. Uh, you can donate via the website. Uh, up the back, we've got some uh, envelopes you can put some money in. There's some collection tins there, too. Uh, and there's also some fundraising ideas on the website, the ADRA website as well. Uh, if you would like to hold an event uh, to raise funds for some of the great humanitarian causes that uh, Adra is supporting. Uh, we've also, I also have some of these uh, collect money collection boxes. And um, if you would like one of these, I have a few. Uh, you can take them home and you can uh, add, add funds to them. Come and see me after the service. I'll be around and uh, you can have one too. So I just encourage you all to, yeah, please donate to this worthy cause and thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you very much, Nick. The other announcement is about membership transfers. You probably remember that last Sabbath we presented you the names and we are going to present you the names again. Those who are taking their membership out of New World Church and also those who are going to be voted in. We have not received any comments, any observations, so we put this recommendation by the church board to you for a vote. Is there a second to it? Yes, there is. So all those in favor that these transfers would happen, please indicate it by raising your hand. Thank you very much. Opposed by the same sign? No one is opposing. It has carried. And the last announcement is about the Sabbath, which is coming two weeks from now, on the 20th of April. There's going to be an uh, Ellen White symposium happening in the gym from this hour. So there is not going to be adult Sabbath school in Salisbury Hall on the 20th of April. And then we are all asked to go to the gym where this, the Ellen White symposium is going to take place. With this, I'm handing it over to Bjorn, who is our worship leader for today. God bless. But I'm going to, there we go, we're going to push on. I'd like to congratulate the remnant of the remnant that stayed behind on the Easter break to be with us uh, this Sabbath morning. Very lovely to see you all. I'm going to add one announcement to the lineup. And um, actually, we have a number of people here on stage. Um, most of the adults here uh, are in one way or another, have been or are currently part of the toddler group ministry. Now, let me tell you a little bit about that. Every, well, most Fridays, here uh, on Friday mornings, s about 60 families from the community, now these are not Newbold families or, or even uh, families from our church community, often from Bracknell, from, from the sometimes from Wokingham, from the surrounding areas come in uh, to, uh, to have toddler time. 60 families, often uh, over 100 people when you count uh, grandma, grandpa, uh, children, uh, parents, 
and it's a wonderful, wonderful way to serve our community. People willingly come here and, and you know, and once, and really we get told all the time, this is the best toddler group in Bracknell. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, we have uh, parents helping out. Parents often send their kids, after they've been part of toddler group, they send them over to our primary school uh, to continue their uh, time with the Newbold community. If you are able to help out this toddler group, we really, really appreciate it. We often, we always need volunteers on Friday morning. Uh, so it starts at around 9.30 in terms of setup and ends at about 11.30 noon. Uh, anytime you can make it in, 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 uh, within those parameters. Also, Thursday night, a group sets up uh, all the toys, there's a bounce house and a bunch of other stuff for the toddlers the next day. So if you're able to help in either respect, speak to any of the adults you see here, and they will be happy to direct you to do what to, uh, to, to help you uh, learn what to do next, who to talk to, and we will uh, gladly recruit you to be part of that team. So thank you for being part uh, of the solution here, really serving the community. That said, I would like to welcome us all uh, again this Sabbath morning. We are going to start with a classic. It's all classics today, really easy. Nobody needs to learn these songs. These are all songs we've been singing since we were kids. We'll start with What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and we'll ask you all to stand for that wonderful song. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our loving God, it's so great to know that we have a very special friend in Jesus, our Lord and Savior. It's so great to know that you are a loving God who, who smiles on us, a God who did everything for our joy, for our blessing, everything for our salvation. Lord, with that sense, with that image of you, we are coming to you this morning. And we would like to hear from you, from your word. And we are giving over to you all our burdens. You know what we are carrying, what issues, what questions, what struggles we have. And we know, Lord, that where we do not see a solution, you have thousands solutions. Give us therefore peace, 
give us living faith, strengthen our faith on this worship, and help us to serve you with all our heart. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. I would like to ask the deacons to take up the offerings and the tithes. Good morning, church. Uh, today's scripture reading comes from Mark 13, 33. It says, And leaving them, he embarked and crossed over to the other side. And they forgot to take along loaves of bread. And except for one loaf, they had nothing with them in the boat. And he instructed them, saying, Watch, be wary of the yeast of the Pharisees and of the yeast of Herod. And this they reasoned with one another, was because they have no loaves of bread. And knowing this, he says to them, why do you reason? That is because you have no loaves of bread. Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Do you keep an obdurate heart in you, having eyes and do not look, and having ears you do not listen and do not remember? When I broke the five loaves of bread among the 5,000, how many baskets filled with the fragments did you gather up? 
they say to him, Twelve. When, he s when the seven among the four thousand, how many basketfuls of fragments did you gather up? And they say, Seven. And he said to them, Do you still not understand? And they come to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man to him and implore him that he might touch him. And making the blind man's hands, he led him away outside the village and spitting in his eyes. He laid his hands upon him and inquired of him, Do you see anything? And looking up, he says, I see men, such as if I perceive trees walking about. Then he laid his hands upon his eyes and stared, and stared hard. He was restored, and he saw everything clearly. He went away to his house, saying, You must not even go into the village. And Jesus and his disciples departed to the village of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Whom do people say to be me? Whom do people say me to be? And they say to him, saying, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and yet others of and yet others on what on the prophets. And he asked them, But whom do you say me to be? And in reply Peter says to him, You are the anointed and be warned, set, and be warned them sternly, and they should not tell anyone about him. And he began to teach them that it is necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things, and to be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes, and to be killed, and after three days to rise again. He made this declaration frankly, and taking hold of him, Peter began to admonish him, but he, turning out and looking at his disciples, admonished Peter, and says, get behind me, accuser, because you think not of these things of God, but of those of men. Time for our children's story. If we can grab all the children, come up the front. Ugh. Hello. Lots of kids today. How are you all? I've got something in my bag. I have another bag in my bag. I'm going to open the bag and take something out. Can anyone tell me what this is? It's a peanut. Okay. Anyone know what sort of animals like peanuts? Elephants? Chipmunks? Any others? Girls? Okay. Let me tell you another animal. In fact, it tells me on the front of the bag. What's the, that animal? What is it? A, a, a monkey, right? You know in some countries, in some places, they actually call peanuts monkey nuts. Monkey nuts. That's what it says here, monkey nuts. And they call them monkey nuts because monkeys really love these nuts. Now, a long time ago, people wanted monkeys either for zoos or for pets. They kept them as pets. So they would have to go out into the wild where the monkeys live in the trees, and they would have to capture the monkeys. So they had to figure out a way to capture those monkeys. You want to know how they captured those monkeys? OK. What they would do, they would get a container, okay? They would tie the container to a tree, and they would put in the container some nuts. Now, the container had to be a particular size. 
and they knew what size it would have to be. Now, the monkeys, they would find out that they were nuts. So you know what they would do? They would go to the container, and what would they do? They put their hand in the container and grab the nuts, right? They wanted those nuts. Now they have a fistful of nuts in their hand. But there's a problem. Their hand is now stuck in the jar. Do you want to try and pull my hand out? You can? The monkey's hand was stuck. The only way that they would get free is if they let go of the nuts, then they could pull their hand out. But those monkeys wanted those nuts so much, they wouldn't let go. There was nothing you could do would cause them to let go of those nuts. All the hunter had to come around then and do was come around and take the monkey. Because the monkey was stuck. He couldn't go anywhere. He stuck with his hand in the jar. So the monkey wanted those nuts so much that it was willing to get trapped. It was so afraid of losing its nuts, it could have escaped. It could have had freedom. It could have gone back to the wild and gone climbing trees. Instead, it was so fearful of losing the nuts that it stayed there, stuck in the container, until it was captured. So then the monkey would get taken away and unfortunately get put in a zoo or get taken as a pet or somewhere, which is not as good a life as if it was out in the wild. But you know, for us, we have things that we hold on to things that we hold on to that prevent us from being free, from living the best life we can possibly live. And one of those is fear. Who's afraid of something here? Who's ever been afraid before? Okay, so you all know what it's like to be afraid. But sometimes it stops us from doing things, right? You might be afraid of making friends, you might be afraid of school, you might be afraid of running a race, there are things that we're afraid of doing, but if we're afraid of doing them, then we don't get to do them, right? How can we overcome that fear? So if I've got a fear, let's say I'm afraid of, I'm afraid of participating in a race at school, because I think I might not win. If I've got this fear, my hand's stuck again, right? I'm holding on to the fear. Or I'm holding on to a doubt. I'm holding on to something that is stopping me from experiencing something. So just like the monkey holding on to the nuts that it wanted, we hold on to fear. We hold on to things that we don't want to do and we don't give them up. But if we're afraid of something, if we want to free our hands from the jar and be able to do things, who can we go to? We can, go, we can go to God, right? Because God will help us. It says The Bible says that God will help us with our fear. If we're afraid of something, if there's something we can't let go, there's something preventing us from being free, from living our lives, from experiencing new things, we can ask God for strength. We can ask God for freedom. We can say, dear God, please help us to have the strength to do this thing that I'm afraid of. Or, dear God, please help us not to doubt whether I can do something. Give me strength and confidence in myself. So I'm going to finish off with a prayer. So the moral of the story is, if there's something you're holding on to, a fear that you find it hard to give up, you find it hard to let go, we can ask God to help us let go of that fear and be free. Okay, someone would like to say a quick prayer for us. You'd like to say a prayer for us? Okay. Hey Jesus, thanks for, for my friends and thank you 
for Dina and thank you for Sophie and thank you for Abigail and Olivia and thank you for all my friends. Thank you for my school. Thank you for Miss Martin. Thank you for Miss Brown. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, kids, if you go up to the deacons up the back, there are some worksheets for you too. Thank you. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank my friend Nick for also te telling the, the children's story. Nick, if, if I'd realized you were already doing the Adra pitch, I wouldn't have asked you to do the, the kid's story. Maybe if Robin's not feeling doing the sermon, you could do that as well, just to you know, keep things consistent. You know, Nick, Nick came here fairly recently to Newbold, and he came up to me and he said, uh, if you need help with anything, I'm, you, know, you can ask me. And literally, every time I've asked him, he's, he's up for it. So... That, that's uh, an opportunity for you all to pitch him with uh, the ministries that you want him to be involved with. But no, thank you very much. And thank you also to these wonderful musicians and the praise choir, especially the kids uh, that are here this morning. We're practicing until 8.30 last night. Dedication. We have Amazing Grace coming up. So I'm going to ask us all to stand and sing another classic that we all love, Amazing Grace.
Uh, good morning. Actually, we're, oh, we almost, no, we're not quite in the afternoon yet, so I'll still stick with morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, um, uh, the sermon today was, is, is, um, was going to be originally um, just on the miracle that um, our scripture reading today focused on. But uh, I thought it was going to be an easy sermon, and so I, I went and started looking at the books and whatnot, and then found out that everybody um, had very differing opinions on this, and many of them weren't actually quite sure what was going on in there. Um, I, I do want to stress that I, I do have solutions to this this morning, so please don't think I'm just going to leave you hanging. Um, but our text is from the book of Mark, and Mark um, has a couple of things that... Uh, I suppose we should, I, I, will, I will tell you first. Mark is concerned um, with um, showing who Christ is and Christ crucified. That is Mark's sort of main thing. So he wants you to know who Jesus is and what that means. And our text today, more specifically, is about seeing or not seeing this point. Um, and the other thing that you should know about Mark is that Mark often tells things by putting things within a context. Um, and so that means our main sort of focus this morning, um, if you just look at it by itself, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But when you look at the bits on either side of our main section, uh, and I'll tell you about what they are in a minute, um, that helps us focus on the, on the middle part, on the bit that we want to spend our time on. Um, so if you sort of think of this um, like a sandwich, um, a sandwich has a number of very essential elements, otherwise it stops being a sandwich. Um, I, at least in my household, or maybe in just me, I suppose, um, you need a piece of bread on the bottom, and then you have something in the middle of your sandwich, and then you have another piece of bread on top. And that, at least as far as I can tell, following Plato, are the essential elements of what a sandwich is about. And so the bread, the pieces of bread that we have, help focus us on the bits, help focus us on the bits in the middle of the bread. It helps grasp the, the parts of, of the middle. And so this is um, kind of what we're looking at today. So our miracle today, the miracle story of a blind man being healed, is, is put into context by the pieces of bread on either side of it, which we have read, but I will go through this with you. Now, it is important to know that this is still a metaphor. Um, I don't want to say that the miracle is the only important part, and the parts on either side are not important. Um, each one of those is sermon-worthy in and of itself. But for today, um, we're going to be looking at that. We are going to be... Um, using the outside parts as a way to focus on the middle, but also very strangely using the middle to focus on the outside parts. Now, um, I have asked for the um, text to be put on the screen behind me. Um, I hope that will happen. Oh, there we go, wonderful. Um, I will sort of suggest if you do have your Bibles, get your Bibles out and turn to Mark 8, um, and we're going from about verse 13 onwards. Um, this is the part of where I normally put forward a, a plea um, to, or at least I, I put forward an advert for paper Bibles. Um, as, uh, with, if, with a paper Bible, you can see so much more on the page. Um, the, the information density on a Bible is so much greater um, than if you happen to have um, one of these. Um, I'll make sure I'm not looking at something weird. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of these, which is a phone. Um, you know, a phone, well, you, everybody has one of these, and I do know you have your text on the phone. Um, the problem is that you can only see small parts of the text. And so if you need to look at it, you know, you've got to keep swiping one way um, to get to the next few verses. And, and then if you swipe the other way, you match with some Brazilian hottie on AdventistSingles.com, and that's the end of you listening to the rest of my sermon. So I'm going to suggest, if you can, make sure you have a paper Bible. But if not, the text will be behind me, and we will reference this as we go through. So our first top slice, if you like, and I've jumped out of Mark into Matthew. Here we go. Our first slice today um, is, is the top slice from verses 13 to 21. And I'm not going to go through every verse. Uh, I'm going to go through very few verses, but I am going to tell you the context of what is being said uh, so we can understand 
Now, the disciples have just seen a great miracle. Jesus has fed um, the 4,000, and they have seen and picked, they've seen this happen. They've picked up lots and lots of different parts um, of the leftover bits of bread. Uh, they have seen him do all of this with their own eyes. They have seen it all. And then immediately after this, the Pharisees come along to Jesus, and they say to him, show us a sign from heaven. Which, of course, placement-wise, is a little strange because we've just had a, we've just had a couple of miracles. Um, Jesus references the feeding of the 5,000, and he also references the feeding of the 4,000. Why do the Pharisees need to see something else? And so Jesus rejects them, and he rejects the Pharisees for their unbelief. And then the disciples get in the boat, and off they, they go across, um, uh, across the lake. And the disciples get in the boat, and they carry with themselves one loaf of bread. And Mark points this out to us um, at, the, at the very beginning of this. And Jesus says, you need to watch out. You need to watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees, and you need to watch out for the yeast of Herod. And the yeast of Herod is the same problem of the Pharisees. And Jesus means, look, watch out for the unbelief of these people. But the disciples, because they're stupid, look at him and go, well, it's because we haven't brought enough bread, have we? Um, I don't quite know how you get from watch out for the yeast to we have no bread, but that just goes to show, and this is Mark, remember, that just goes to show how badly the disciples understand what Jesus is talking about. How little do they see? So the disciples are not very clever, and Mark does this as a general rule, I think, especially, yeah, especially Mark. Um, he, he likes to point out how the disciples don't get things, and so this is part of, of his, his overall theme, if you like. So Jesus says to them um, in verse um, 17 to 18, I suppose, um, knowing this, he says to them, why do you reason that it is because you have no loaves of bread? Do you not perceive nor understand. Do you keep an obdurate heart in you? Having eyes, do you not li uh, li listen? Sorry, do you not look? And having ears, do you not listen? And do you not remember? Um, the, the Greek here, uh, Mark is actually, I should pr probably put this here. Um, Mark is very rough Greek. Um, he's very rude in ways. Um, and the English translation I've chosen today, which is D.B. Hart's uh, version, is similarly quite rough and ready. Um, and, and so the words and, and the phrasing of this are kind of a little bit um, tricky. So thank you, Ryan, for wherever you are, for blazing your way through that. Um, I know it's a, it's a difficult uh, text to get through. So Jesus says to the disciples, in, in, you know, going up to verse 21, do you still not understand? They have seen everything that they need to see, and the disciples do not understand what Jesus is doing or who he is. So... This, then, is our first piece of bread, all right? So we have the disciples. They do not understand um, what Jesus is about or how he's going to do anything that he says that he's going to do. And so now we move on to the, our meat. And so this is verses 22 to 26. Yep, and we've got that behind me, so you can uh, follow along. Um, and they come to Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida is kind of interesting. Um, Mark doesn't have any comment about Bethsaida. But if you go to the book of Matthew, Matthew um, has Jesus, and I think it's in uh, chapter 11, cursing Bethsaida and a couple of other places for their lack of faith. Bethsaida is a place where they do not believe in Jesus. And this makes this story a little maybe more curiouser than it should do. Um, Bethsaida according to Matthew, has nothing worthy in it and is worthy of destruction. But for Mark, there are at least a few people in Bethsaida who are willing to take somebody to Jesus because they think that he can do something for him. Now, it's important to note that um, they bring a blind man out to him. They, Jesus does not go into, um, into Bethsaida necessarily, um, but they bring the blind man to him. They recognize their limits. The people in Bethsaida, for whatever their sins, um, at least for this small group of people, they recognize that they cannot do something 
in and of themselves, but they do know somebody who can. However that happened, I don't know. They must have heard about Jesus through the grapevine. But they said to themselves, here is a man who can help this blind man that we have here in front of us. And so Jesus takes the blind man by the hands and then leads him out of the village somewhere else. This is very curious. Why would you want to go outside of the village? Well, maybe if Matthew's right, um, Jesus doesn't want to do miracles in a place where people don't believe in him. Um, there is another and uh, maybe more interesting um, possibility. Uh, the Bible comes, at least the Old Testament comes in a couple of flavors. Um, one of them is in Hebrew and the other one is in Greek. And this phrase, taking him by the hands and leading him out, is a, a, a repetition or a very close repetition of the phrase when um, God takes Israel out of Egypt. So Israel gets taken out of Egypt, a land of darkness and of slavery, and, it le and he leads them into the promised land. And so it could be that Mark is hearkening back to the sort of the Greek version um, of the Old Testament here, and so you'll pick up this illusion of coming out of something bad into something better, going from one place of darkness and, and, and um, sort of slavery and idolatry in a way to a place um, of proper and true worship. That's definitely one option for it, and I'm, I'm sticking with that one. But then Jesus takes the man, and he spits on his face. Um, no, I'm not going to try it out. Um, it's a very curious way um, of spitting. Spitting in the, what's called the Circum Mediterranean, uh, which is basically the bit around uh, the Mediterranean Ocean. Around that area, um, there are a number of different places where spitting is used as a way to heal people. Uh, now, the Jews, uh, at least a little bit after Jesus, when they were sort of fiddling around with the Talmud, said, no, you should never use spittle for, for um, uh, healing people. But for the pagan nations around them, this is definitely true. Um, Suetonius, um, who's writing about the emperor Vespasian, I don't worry about who they are, but just know that he's an emperor, um, said this, and I'll quote it. Um, Vespasian, who against all expectation had mounted the throne as a holy new prince, still lacked presence and divinely confirmed majesty. But this was granted to him when he healed the blind man. For at least uh, one writer writing about one emperor, um, one of the signs of divinity uh, to confirm your divinity is the healing of a blind man. And I don't think, well, I think it's a good possibility here that Mark is also picking up on this idea. For Jesus is yet again confirming that he is a king by doing what kings are supposed to do, which is to heal people. And then Jesus says something very strange. He lays his hands on him, he spits in his face, he lays his hands on him, and then he says, Do you see anything? And then the man says in verse 24, I see men such that it is as if I perceive trees walking about. Now, this is a very curious um, segment here. Because knowing Jesus and who Jesus is as readers, and having read at least the first eight chapters of Mark, you would have understood that Jesus can do these things and he's perfectly capable of doing them. But when it comes to this section, Jesus touches the man, and then says, can you see anything? As if he doesn't know whether the man can see or not. You'd expect him to be completely healed. But this man turns around and says, no, I only see men as if they are walking about as if they are trees. In other words, his sight is not fully there. And then in verse 25, Jesus again lays his hands on, his, uh, lays his hands on the man's eyes. And he stared hard and he was restored, and he saw everything fully. In the, first, say, in the first stage, the man is not completely blind, but he is not completely healed either. He's at a halfway stage. And then Jesus has to touch him again, and then complete, if you like, um, the healing. Now, why two touches? Um, some of the older, more critical, and probably not very Christian commentators perhaps suggested, and this was maybe 
last century, uh, or two centuries ago now, um, that the reason why this happened was that Jesus actually didn't know his power. So he's still sort of testing out his powers. I imagine if you had sort of woken up one day and been given superpowers. Um, you might want to try them out just to see if they work first. And maybe Jesus wasn't quite sure of who he was here, and so he touches the man. And he's not quite sure has he done anything or, or not. And I don't think that's a, a very um, a good uh, conclusion to that. I think there are much better things. I think um, there, are some, there are some things in the text that I think help us understand this. Um, it's probably symbolic, and it's probably symbolic of what Mark is trying to tell us about the disciples and about the disciples' failure to understand Jesus. They don't understand who he is, and so this is going to take time. It's only the second touch that gives the man his full sight. One touch only does a little bit. A second sight, a second touch is needed to give him complete sight. Light dawns gradually. As Jesus said in verse 21, do you still not understand? They've seen certain things, and yet they still don't get it fully. They don't understand what Jesus is about. Now, this idea of, of light dawning gradually is a fairly common one, and I've, I've only got two examples, but there are more um, uh, out there, but I'm just picking two, one secular and, and one religious. The idea of people's sight and knowledge becoming fuller as time goes by. And the first example I give is Plato's cave. Um, some of you might have been taught that in college um, or have read about it. In Plato's cave, there is a man in a cave and he has his back to the opening of the cave and light is shining in from behind him and casting shadows on the wall in front of him. And so him and all the other people in the cave are trying to figure out what on earth these shapes uh, mean. Um, and as time goes by, the man eventually gains complete knowledge by crawling out of the cage and then fully seeing once and for all. True knowledge, true sight is done in stages. Now, that's not just a pagan idea. Um, it's also a biblical one. Paul um, points this out to us in Corinthians that we see in a mirror um, darkly or dimly, depending on your translation. In other words, we see bits, but we don't see everything. Things can take time to unravel and to show themselves to us. So um, I think this is perhaps the reason why this happens. Um, it just takes time. And then verse 26, um, Jesus sends the man away to his house and says to him, in some versions at least, you must not go even into the village, which is a very curious thing. After all, his friends have brought him to Jesus um, they, they brought a man to Jesus expecting him to do something, and Jesus whips him away somewhere, and then you never get to see what happens. At least they couldn't bring sight to the blind man, but they knew somebody who could. So our meat of our sandwich here, I, I suppose, our miracle, shows a two-stage revealing of sight. First you can see a little bit, and then you will see fully. And then this leads us on to um, our, our next slice of bread of our sandwich, uh, which I'm going to call the bottom slice. Um, and this is um, verses 27 to 33. Um, so what's happening is that Jesus sits his disciples down, because remember, this is Mark's overriding idea. Who, who am I? He, he sits the disciples down and he says to them, who do you think I am? Or who do people say that I am? And the disciples toss out a, a few ideas. Well, some people say that uh, you might be John the Baptist. Um, some people say that you are Elijah. Other people say that you are one of the prophets. I mean, these are all sort of very great and noble people. But Peter, in a flash of inspiration, um, says to him, You are the anointed, you are the Messiah. And now you might be thinking, ah, okay, so we've just had the disciples, when they've been in the boat, they don't get Jesus at all. We've now sort of got to the point where they are finally beginning to see who Jesus finally is. Jesus is somebody who the disciples now recognize. But the problem is, the reality is, is that the disciples are only seeing Jesus as the man who saw the people walking about as trees. Because immediately after this, when, G when Peter says to Jesus, hey, 
um, you are the Messiah, Jesus then starts saying, okay, this is what the Messiah is going to have to do. He's going to go in, he's going to be, um, well, there's a number of things uh, that he says here. He's going to suffer many things. He's going to be rejected by the, um, the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and this is all in verse 31, and to be killed and then rise three days later. That is what the Messiah means. And then immediately, Peter pulls him aside and says, oh, hang on, no, please don't do that. You're not supposed to do that. And Jesus' response to him, which is probably one of the more famous um, texts in the Bible, um, get behind me, Satan, get behind me, accuser. Peter does not understand who Jesus is. We might think that he's on his way there, but he actually has no clue who Jesus is. The disciples do not know who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. The entire reason why Jesus has come is written here in these verses here, to suffer, to die, to, and to be raised again. That is his purpose. Nobody gets it. So the question is, will the disciples ever see? Now, the traditional, normal way of understanding this text is the bit that we have just read where, um, in, in, in Mark 8, where Peter recognizes Christ. He says, you are the Christ. And so some commentators traditionally have said, look, here is the bit where they finally get the story. But as we've just sort of pointed out, immediately after that, Mark shows us, Mark points out to us that in no way does Peter understand who Jesus is. Some people have suggested that maybe Mark 10, and we won't look at this, but you, this is just for, for your later perusal when you go at home and, and have your Sabbath lunch. Um, Mark 10 is another healing miracle of a blind man. It's Bartimaeus. And um, some people have suggested that that uh, miracle is the beginning of the true sight for the disciples, because this is the bit where Jesus starts to go into Jerusalem and to do the things that he is supposed to do as the Messiah. But I think the best, um, the best maybe solution to will the disciples ever see who Jesus is is found in Mark 16, um, verse 12. And I haven't, got, I haven't asked them to put the text up there, and it's okay, you don't need to look there, but I will tell you about it. Now, it is true that some of the... Um, this text is not found in the earliest manuscripts of Mark. Um, it's only the later manuscripts that have this little section. But um, in this... There are two men walking along the road. To, it's the road to Emmaus story, for those of you who, who may be familiar with it. There are two men walking to Emmaus, and they are joined by Jesus, but they do not see who Jesus is at all. And um, Jesus walks with them, and then he explains what has been happening in Jerusalem with the death and, res and, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And he sits down and has a meal with them, and then he breaks the bread, and that point is the final point at which the disciples finally get it. Now, admittedly, there's only two of them, but that's probably our first point at which they truly understand who Jesus is, that he is the Messiah, and the man they've been talking to is the Messiah finally once and for all. Now everything comes into focus. They get who Jesus is, but it takes the resurrection for this to take place. So our sandwich then is complete the disciples don't know something, then we have a miracle healing story of a man gaining his sight in different parts. And then the disciples maybe begin to get bits of sight, but it's not very good. It has to take, it's going to take a while for them to fully understand and truly understand who Jesus is. So, um, we're going to look at some conclusions then to what this means and some applications. Um, I've chosen some of them um, if you don't like them in particular, um, you are more than welcome to email me at my personal email address, which is mg at newboldchurch.org. Um, so our first point here is the natural order of the world is blindness. The world cannot see Jesus, and they do not see him as a king or as a messiah. They do not see him as a rightful king who one day will come back and take control of his creation. And not only does the world not see this, but the world is actively hostile to him. If you look at Peter's response to Jesus, that is not the response of somebody who understands what, he is, what Jesus is supposed to be doing. Peter is actively hostile. 
And there are many other places um, in the New Testament where it talks about the world being actively hostile to Jesus as well. You are actively hostile to God unless if you are saved as well. Um, you know, as, as many people have pointed out, if Jesus um, did come back at this time, we'd crucify him all over again. And that is because you do not understand or love God. You cannot know and love God. But do you believe that the world is blind? Do you really believe that the world is blind? Is it just an intellectual idea that we have in our heads that the people outside the world, our neighbors, for example, are blind and need help? Do you believe that the people who walk up and down outside Newbold College here, do you really believe that they are blind and are in need of desperate help from God? Do you believe that the people who sit in your offices, do you believe that they are as blind in their unbelief as the Pharisees were? Because unless if they are given sight to see Jesus and understand who he is, they will be unable to give Jesus his proper due. And when he returns, it will be too late. Everyone will acknowledge, everybody will bow their knee and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord when he returns. It just really depends on what side you're on as to what then happens. If the world is blind and cannot see Jesus, then it is our job to bring the blind to Jesus uh, to be healed. Just like the Bethsaidans brought the blind man, so must we do the same thing. We cannot give sight ourselves, but we can lead blind people to people who can give sight. Our job must be to bring people to a place where they can find Jesus as Messiah. And this must mean that our churches point to this in what we do. It means that our sermons must point to this. And you can hold Marcel and Janusz's feet to the fire to keep them in line about this. But it also means that our lives must show this to our neighbors and to our colleagues, because how else will they know? This means two things. Firstly, that we must be willing to invite people to hear the good news, as in that is an obligation placed on all of us. If you truly honestly think that the people who you know and love but who are not Christians um, do not know God, then you must be willing to bring them to a place where they can. And secondly, there must be a place where the good news can be heard. It is no good summoning up the courage to invite somebody to come to Newbold um, to listen to something here if the gospel is not going to be preached. Now, if the natural order of the world is blindness, then it also means that all other ways to reach God are similarly blind. We currently live in a world with many different religions who all claim um, to be paths to God, and we live within a philosophy um, that says that all paths will eventually lead to God. You have your way, I have my way, and we should live and let live when it comes to other people's spiritual paths. But this is not the biblical position, and at least in most of the Western world, telling people that their path might be wrong um, isn't very popular. It wasn't very popular in the ancient world. Um, have a look at Elijah. Um, when he um, had his showdown with the priests of Baal and what happened afterwards, he was not a very popular man. The prophets in the Old Testament stood up against the multiple gods of the age. And please note that those multiple gods were actually in Israel. They weren't outside Israel in what you might consider the pagan nations. They were actually inside. They stood up against those gods and said, Yes, there are many gods here, but there is only one God that you are allowed to worship. And they weren't very popular because of it. And they were hounded in all sorts of different ways. Look at Jeremiah um, and, and many of the other prophets, hounded from place to place. Jesus was very explicit about the fact that there is one way to God, and it was through him exclusively. Now, this is a truth, but it is very important that we know that there are times and places to say this. Um, things like this need to be said very sensitively and when needed, and I'm going to suggest that the first, second, or even third thing that comes out of your mouth shouldn't be anything like this if you're talking to somebody outside. Um, there is no point going up and telling people that they are blind. That's not a way uh, to work. But it is a, a biblical reality, and the Bible makes this very clear in many points, that this is the state of the world that we live in. 
And if the time comes, and when the time comes, to share this biblical position, we must have the conviction ourselves that this is true, and that we will require, I suppose, wisdom and courage um, to sensitively share this. So our first, this is our first point. The natural order of the world is blindness. Everybody in the world is blind, and that must have consequences on how we think and act towards our fellow blind men and blind women. Our job is to bring people to Jesus that, so that he can be given his proper due as uh, Messiah and King. And this means that we must point out who Jesus is and what he means. And that needs to take place, whether that takes place in our churches, in our small groups, in our homes, or outside interactions, in, sorry, outside interactions, that is our primary goal. My second point is this. You can be in the right place at the right time with the right person and still be blind. Um, one of my, I don't, I'm not going to call him a favorite, but at least one of the Old Testament scholars um, from the 1900s, Herman Gunkel, pointed this out in a number of different places, how there are various people in the Old Testament who um, are visited by God but fail to see who and what they are looking at. And the, the, I think probably the easiest example is Abraham, when he is visited by God and a couple of angels um, underneath his oak tree. Um, they visit him, and Abraham has no clue who he is seeing and dialoguing with. And I think this motif still continues into the New Testament, at least in this particular case, of people who are visited by something incredible, in this case Jesus, and do not understand who he is. The disciples are blind. They have spent three years with Jesus, watching him perform miracle after miracle, listening to him teach day after day, and yet they ask the wrong questions, they had the wrong motives, and they came to the wrong conclusions all the time. Likewise, you can be a lifelong churchgoer and be blind. You can have all the theological degrees that Newbold College can throw at you and still be blind. You can be in the right place at the right time and still be blind unless God reveals to you who Jesus is. And until he does that, you will be like the disciples and Pharisees, asking the wrong questions. Uh, you will be resisting um, him completely, and you will, I suppose in some way, have certain consequences to that. I think, um, I know I am speaking in an Adventist church, so um, most of you will be familiar with the church of Laodicea, which we are often uh, tempted to call ourselves, or at least we think that we are. And the church of Laodicea, um, Jesus calls that church wretched, poor, blind, pitiful, and naked. Jesus is talking about a church. He's not talking about some pagan organization outside. He's not talking about you know, uh, the Greco-Roman world of, of weirdness and all their gods and their cults. He is talking about a church. This is not a pagan, this is not a pagan thing like you know, Nineveh um, or, or Syria where you would, would expect people to not know what they're supposed to be doing. This is a church. In theory, this church knows what it should be doing but for some reason, it's not functioning. In this particular case, Jesus says it's blind. So unless if you understand who Jesus is and what he did, you cannot be comfortable simply because you happen to be sitting inside a church and be surrounded by nice people and maybe nice messages. So this is my second point. Proximity doesn't mean anything, but revelation means everything. Being near to Jesus doesn't mean you see who he is. Um, and you will not understand him or what he means until you truly see him. And that, that true sight, he will have to do for you. But you must put yourself into situations where that can take place. The blind man had to be brought to Jesus. Jesus didn't come to him. And lastly, sight only comes through Jesus. Other people, other religions, and other systems, I guess philosophical systems, um, will tell you that they can provide sight and they can provide meaning, but at least according to our biblical text, sight came through Jesus and Jesus only. And it's true. 
that the Pharisee graduating class of AD 33 at Jerusalem College, they had read all the latest scrolls, and they had written extensive essays on their tablets. But all they could provide to the people around them was unbelief. When faced with Jesus, all they could do was to produce unbelief and spiritual blindness. And I think maybe, uh, especially in an academic uh, context here, um, this is, this is uh, something, a point to remember, because we can mistake academic ingenuity and insight as truth, much like the Pharisees did. The reality was Jesus was the only one who could bring any spiritual light at all. Only Jesus could open that man's eyes and restore him to a full and proper state. And please note that our story today points out that that, gradu- that that restoration of sight is a gradual process. Both the man and the disciples had to go through multiple attempts until they could see fully. And this means that sitting around us today in this church right now, there are people at various stages of sight. Some of you know exactly who Jesus is, and you give him proper credit and proper due, and that is good and right. Some of you don't. Some of you are working on it, and some of you are not. But maybe you will next week, or maybe you will next year. Don't put it off. Sight comes from Jesus when he chooses in his own time, and you cannot force this either on yourself or on other people. And sometimes we think that simply because we've told somebody something, because I have told you a piece of light, that therefore you understand and now need to behave accordingly. But we need to understand that understanding comes from God and God alone and in God's own time. The uniqueness of Jesus is something that must be talked about and shown to other people. So, if you find yourself thinking that today, yes, I am blind, and I do not recognize Christ, either as Messiah, or either as King, or what He has done, then I would like to encourage you to begin the process of discovering who He is. But you must put yourself in a situation where that can happen. If you already know Christ and what He has done, then I would like to suggest and encourage you that you must see how this has to result in action towards your fellow blind friends and fellow neighbors. Thank you, thank you, Robin, for that compelling deep dive into Mark 8. Uh, I also am very hungry after all those references to sandwiches, so it's a good thing lunch is coming up. Let's all strand stand for How Great Thou Art. Oh, my Savior, 
of the grace, then please feel free to join with me. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen. Uh, you may all have a seat. It's been a real blessing worshiping with you all. Thank you so much. Uh, whether you are a total newbie or someone that's come here for years, we're so grateful to have had this moment with you here uh, in person or online. Uh, thank you. All. I hope you have a very blessed Sabbath. I'd like to also uh, say another round of thank yous to everyone that's been involved with this service. It takes an enormous amount of, amount of work uh, to pull a service together. Uh, there are people working behind the scenes, on stage, etc., to really uh, make this a special time together. So thank you, everyone, for your efforts. Uh, we have a postlude as well, so we'll uh, welcome you to remain seated for the postlude from our wonderful musical team. Have a fantastic Sabbath.
Thank you.